The second area I want to highlight is a broader foreign policy agenda. From nuclear proliferation to conflict, international criminal gangs or terrorist groups, the great security challenges of this century are global, and they need European leadership. I think it's really important that we understand how Europe fits into the global political architecture today. Both of our countries are close, close allies of the United States, rightly, I think. Not just to ensure security and stability on our own continent, but far beyond. But it's a poisonous and wrong argument to say that a stronger Europe is a threat to the United States. Every American administration since John F. Kennedy has argued for a more united and integrated Europe, and so does the current one. They know that we cannot rely solely on Pax Americana. Power is fragmenting around the world, despite the fact that its citizens in the U.S. will remain the world's richest for many decades to come. The U.S. will no longer be the only power on the world stage and the only force, the only hegemonic force in global affairs. The question for Europeans is whether we want to be players or spectators in the new world order, whether we want to support the U.S. in promoting our shared values or stand aside and let others shape the century for us. To me, the answer is blindingly obvious. Each nation state within the European Union retains its own direct national interests and resources. The UK continues to be a major power through its military, economic and development resources and through its seat on the, European, on the UN Security Council. But if we want to avoid a so-called G2 world, a world of China and America, dominated by China and America, we need to make G3 cooperation, the US, China, and the EU work. Now, the EU is never going to be a country like the US or China, but it can be a global force. And there is enormous demand for the EU to play a greater role in global affairs. In the last year alone, we've intervened to stabilize the crisis in Georgia, engaged with both the Ukrainians and Russians in their dispute over gas, agreed bold and ambitious climate change targets, shaped a clear offer of engagement with Iran in support in tandem with a U.S. policy, dispatched a naval mission to the Somali coast to reduce the threat of piracy, and stepped up our effort in Afghanistan with more police and more money, and hopefully in the, in the coming weeks, election observers to ensure that the elections there are credible. After the European Council last week, we now have the prospect of finally resolving Europe's seemingly interminable institutional debate the Irish will vote again on the Lisbon Treaty with legal guarantees in respect of tax, abortion, and defense. On that basis, the EU needs to up its foreign policy game. Again, I want to pick out three, or this time I want to pick out three priorities. First, both nationally and at the EU level, we face choices over finding and then prioritizing the necessary resources. We're just not good enough at this at the moment. For example, we have two million soldiers in uniform between us, yet are only able to deploy 5% of the total at any one time. Or look at the EU budget. There's a mismatch between the EU's strategic objectives and the way the EU deploys its resources. Recent progress has been made, including an additional 129 million euros of aid for Pakistan, announced at last week's EU-Pakistan summit. But the total external relations budget is 8 billion euros. Yet the EU still only plans to spend 254 million euros on Afghanistan this year. That's a mismatch we need to correct. Second, the way we work together. Within the EU, we're still learning how to cooperate effectively across cultural and political divides. And there are still major obstacles to effective engagement with key partners, in particular NATO, which must be overcome. These obstacles give us all another stake in the settlement of the Cyprus question. Third, we need to get better at formulating genuinely strategic responses to difficult foreign policy questions. How much pressure to apply to Iran, how to engage Russia while defending our values and the sovereign rights of countries in the shared neighborhood, how best to influence and support the search for peace between Israel and Palestine. Despite these problems, I'm convinced that an active EU role is no longer a choice. It's a day-to-day -day concrete reality for the Palestinian or Afghan policeman learning skills from a European officer in one of our ESDP operations, or for the Balkan politician piloting the economic modernization of her country required by the European accession process. 
we have a good number of the tools we need to be a key player on the global stage. The world's largest budget and lar largest development budget and largest single market, the most extensive diplomatic network in the world. Dealing with these crises requires more than military might. And that's why the EU's ability to draw on civilian expertise is so important. Pavel, let me conclude on the following note. There's an irony that Europe, in the eyes of its citizens, is synonymous with technocratic administration. Yet its creation and evolution represent one of the most visionary acts of statesmanship in the 20th century. Its success is based on, its, on the sense of solidarity between nations, a preparedness to give and take, a recognition that the benefits of cooperation and compromise far outweigh the vain allure of going it alone. As Europe faces its greatest test since the fall of communism, it needs to recreate that same spirit of bold and visionary leadership allied to, set, to solidarity and a sense of common purpose. These are virtues I know that the rest of Europe can learn from Poland. Adversity gave birth to the European Union. I believe that adversity can lead to its renewal. Thank you very much indeed.